Yeah, I did Perry Farrell yesterday. Oh, did you really? Yeah. It was the best one I've done so far. I'm just learning. Uh, no, um, I'm on my podcast. I'm going my first season. I'm going for like crazy kind of big names because I want to kind of use the marketing through their social media. It's the only way to do it. Yeah. Well, that's kind of <laughs> that's the only way I could do it for sure because I have two magazines that are helping me out, Stab and uh, Wellbone. But... I just like I'm doing like crazy people like Julia Roberts in two weeks. I'm doing Shut like because I I'm like all the people that I know. I look at their followers. I'm like, holy shit, she's got 10 million followers. I'm like you're doing my podcast. She's like, let's go. Um, so obviously the connection to Julia is Danny Motor, right? You kind of Kelly, Kelly really. Oh, okay. uh, but I did meet her with her husband. Um, are we on? We're on. We're on. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's very informal. So what's the name of this joint? Uh, Surf Splendor. Splendor. Kill it. So we've been. It's my first surf podcast. Isn't that ironic? I've done a bunch, but they've always been, you know, photography and all these other people have asked me to do them. But it's the first time people consider me a surfer. This is nice. So we've been at it since 2013. Yeah. My podcast director said that. you guys have 400 and some episodes. Yeah. That's insanity because right now I'm on seven and I'm like, fuck, how many more do I have to do? <laughs> it's crazy. 400 so we is. We do them weekly. Lot, right? The idea was kind of to build it out like uh, the magazines used to be, which is cool. there's an interview section, there's contest results, there's maybe a little gossipy section over here. Mm -hmm. So rebuilding the magazine thing through podcasts. Through podcasts. Oh, that's cool. I yeah. like that. We, I was with the Perry Farrell one the other day. We we're talking about. He, he, I don't know if you know his whole story. I want you to listen to it because it's the side of his life. I went into it thinking, oh, I'm going to ask him about all the stuff I want to know about music, right? Because when you do these podcasts, I'm still learning. So, And I have no real, um, I guess, structure on my podcast. It's, it, in fact, the opening is Donovan saying, the podcast that you'll learn absolutely nothing. And it's, I like the Joe Rogan concept of a conversation and he told me right out of the gates, he just started with, I didn't realize he was from New York, for one. And then he goes, I, I moved on a Greyhound bus, ran away from home to Oceanside. He lived in Oceanside when he was 19. And he and then he lived in Cardiff. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, that was back when the ing and the er were around. And I'm like, the ing and the er? And he's like, surfing, surfer. And he's like, well, those would come out. And I, I missed that so much. It, it, it brought it back to me. I was like, I remember that standing over my friend's shoulders going this is the new server oh my god and we just sit there and you were just just like you're doing now is like the beginning was the opening chapter and it had the crazy wipeout photo or the contents i, I guess yeah, yeah. I'm thinking. Table of contents. and then and then it would get into the ads and even ads were exciting you're like oh my god mm -hmm. this is the new billabong ad that's so sick and then the editorial i i mean you would know better how it all went but um we were going about it and his whole life revolved around the travel part he's like my dream is to go, and he told me this island in the Caribbean, it was like Lutheran or some, some island I really didn't know, because he's like, I can't remember the name. And I'm like, Barbados, Panama. I was like telling him all, and he's like, no. And then he said this weird word, and he goes, I saw it in Surfer Magazine 76 or something. I'm like, how cool was that back then when you would just see this perfect left and be like, oh, I'm going there no matter what it takes, you know? And nowadays we just flip to our phones. Well, I mean, and it was so impactful. You would oh, see that image yeah. and, and it's seared into his brain. hundred percent. And yeah. he still, he never got to go. So the story is you got to listen to the podcast, but his dad promised him that he would get it. If he graduated, he gets to go to this island and he's buying him a 7-2 single fin because that's what year it was. It was 70, God, late 70s, but it was a 7-2 single fin of what he wanted. And his dad never gave it to him. So he's like, I'm out of here. And he got on the bus, Greyhound, Moon Oceanside. And oh I was gosh. just like, oh, that's so dope. But I would be really neat to see him go to his dream trip one day. So he's coming down here and I'm going to shape him. I, I don't know about the 7-2. But I'm going to shape him aboard, and he was super excited. And then I want to ask him if he wants to go on that surf trip of his dream. You That'd know, that one. wouldn't that be cool? What is that, 50 years later? Crazy. <laughs> it's, it's so cool. And it's crazy that you and I don't even know the name of that island. Like, nobody else has been surfing it for the last In fact, he, he said it, and then I go, I don't know if that's right. It's like, it was, I go, um, Tortola? And he's like, no, it's not that one. It was like Lutheran or something like that. And I'm like, I've never heard of that island. But back then, they were showing in Surfer Magazine these places that nowadays we don't even go after. Like, they were were just going after these travel issues where you're like where is that it was like micronesia luckily i got to go to 90 percent of them but that one uh that he knows about i might have to check into maybe but, it's an island we don't know about but you're right though it seems like from the 80s onward it's the same places over and over that people tend to go yeah and there are plenty of others that are just hush hush poor you know? porto escondido yeah. he's like i went to the mexican pipeline i'm like porto and i'm like do you know that there's 
hundreds of point breaks down there that we yeah, just yeah. started finding are not well we did kind of find bara in a sense when we did that um what was taylor's movie when we found that point remember that one it was like one of the one that was in the theaters hit and run i think oh, it was yeah, hit yeah. and run okay and uh Dan we, on the cover. And we were going to porto every year and every year we drive from oaxaco to porto because it would save rusty surfboards on 20 bucks because we'd fly into that airport and we get in the back of a cattle truck and drive right by the point breaks and my i'm a regular foot and i was be when they finally a uh, taylor steel or someone's like hey there's point breaks three hours down the coast this down i'm like what and then every time we'd go there i go i fucking drove by this thing fifth for 10 years like insane every time todd chester's sitting next to me going stop being a pussy because there are cows and shit in the back we're going <laughs> through the thing literally if all we did is take a pee break and look over the cliff we probably would have found a point break. right Ugh, and we go to close out beach breaks right, right, ah, right, right, right. Fuck. um back to the podcast why'd you get into it uh, i really wanted to do it because i i thrive off of knowledge and information not so much bad information but like joe rogan's podcast is therapy for me like I run, I love running, and that's what I turn on every time. I just turn on, and it it, it soothes the soul for me because it's like I get interesting facts and different things, and it's soothing. It's it's meditative. Podcasts are meditative, and I wanted to be on the other side of the mic so I can learn from all these people. Like I did a, a crystal professional. I know that sounds weird. I don't even know what the which she's a jeweler. Uh, you know, she came out today on my podcast. I saw that, and she. Uh, I, my ex-girlfriends and my ex-wife even, everybody was so into stones. And I would always kind of, you know, I'm open-minded to it, but I didn't know anything about it. And it always seemed kind of like silly. You know, you never really put enough of the energy into it and stuff. So I finally was like, I, I kind of want to know more about it. And that was one of the best podcasts I could have ever done because everything she said, I have no idea what she's talking about. So I'm like, what? Okay. And then you, you know, just learning what all of them meant. I was like, oh, there is a lot to this. And I love Bali and Hindu and the Buddhism and all the stuff that are spiritual and like connected and like in the now. And she, you could, you, when, when people are that connected to, I guess, humanity, really, spirituality and stuff, you can feel it. Yeah. And I, she wasn't fake. She wasn't like, oh, God, this is like pulling hair out of my neck. Like, you know, it was just like, what? And you can feel it. You can feel her energy. And you're like, this girl's not, she's not doing it to be cool. She was doing it because she feels that this is something important in the world. So I was just like, okay, this is this is why I'm doing the podcast is because I want to, it's not interviewing Kelly Slater like everybody thinks. Like everyone's like, what are you going to do, Kelly? And I'm like, I don't know. And even like I'm friends with the guys from Blink and all these, uh, I've been interviewing all these other band members that I'm friends with, but not best friends with because it's just the way it's going. I'm just following the, the trail. I'm uh, just breadcrumbs, you know? So like, how do you pick the guest list? I do. I promise <laughs> you this is the funniest process. I think of something that I really like. And the other night it was Perry Farrell. The other night I, I have a really young girlfriend, which is kind of funny because she had no idea who Jane's Addiction was, right? No way. And where I, I heard it the day before. And then I, I go, hey, have you ever heard of Jane's Addiction? And she's like, who's that? <laughs> or what is that? That's crazy. She said, what is that? How old is she? She's 24. Okay. So she's just, and the best is, is a 34 year might not even know, right? Right. Like she's like, uh, what is it? So I play it. She's like, this is so good. And I go, right? I go, how about porno spiros? And then she's like, never heard of it. Put that on. And she's like, what the fuck? And then my, one of my, I put it in my movie. I made life as a movie. It was a um, extreme action sports movie I made by myself. And I directed and produced it. And I used Perry's newest band. It's called Satellite Party. And has his wife in there singing as well. And I go, what about Satellite Party? So we listen to all of it. And I go, you know what? I go, I, I'm, you know, I know him. I'm just going to text him. And I, t well, actually, I didn't text him because I didn't have his number. I texted a friend and then got the number. Luckily, I have friends that know everybody. And they gave me the number. I texted him within five minutes. He's like, let's do this. Let's no go. Way. And I'm like, okay. And then yesterday, a few days ago, I was, we were watching a movie. And, uh, and Julia Roberts was on it. And I go, it's <laughs> so funny. I said, uh, I could put Julie on it. And she goes, no, you can't. And I go, oh, totally. So I, I hit up another friend, got her number instantly. Shout out to Chris Malloy. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, oh, she always talks about you, man. You hit her up. I'm sure she'll, she'll do it. Right away, it's just like, of course, let's do this. So I'm just kind of using, and I'm, those are all big names. And the one with the crystals was my director's uh, old employee. So I'm just letting it come to me, gotcha. basically. And then finding different, like, I'm obviously going to do Griffin, Keller Pinto, and talk about the drive through and and talk about, and surfing, Kalani Rob and the Catch Surf Dudes. I really want to do that one and just talk shit about boogie boarding for a living now. And, you know, not worrying about doing huge errors and stuff for Kalani Rob. 
So just find things that I'm interested in and then find, just let it keep going and just let it potty, you know? Um, do you have any help doing it? Producer? I have one. I have one per, she's my partner. Her name is Annie Graziano and she works with Greg Browning. Mm -hmm. You know, Greg from the yep. drive-thrus. And she works in his office and I'm doing this thing. And I'm like, I can't do this by myself. I tried. Didn't work very well. And a couple of them, I forgot to press record on your beautiful it's little the, machine there. Dude, I've done it. It's Have the, you been at the oh end and seen God. the green light? And went, I get 10 oh minutes in and I realize it. Oh, how about an hour and 30 I did Brutal. the other day with a professional jockey racer and he was the best. At the very end, I looked down and she was there. And she, that one thing she didn't do, we have two cameras, the whole thing. And the one thing she doesn't do is push that stupid red button, right? Right here. It's your one. And I, I, at the very end, I'm like, thanks so much for coming, man. And I look down, it's green. And I look at her and I go, and then she's like, did you? And I'm like, oh, my God. And then we, we he laughed, and we went over, and she goes, you didn't record. And I'm like, no. So we <laughs> we used the audio yeah. from the cameras, yeah, but it yeah. sounded so bad we took it down. I was oh, like, really? yeah. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. He's such a cute little buddy. <laughs> and it's I wanted the visual, and, and it's, you know, it's, it, it sucks. It was right the week before the Kentucky Derby with oh a big gosh. upset. And I was, it would have been cool. But you learn. And that's what's I've made cool. every, every single mistake yeah. you think of. I, I made, can't wait to I'm ask literally you. Literally ten years in, I nine years. Uh, in. Dude, I'm actually. That's what my girl told me today. She goes, "You're gonna learn something from him." He has four hundred something episodes, and I do. I want well, all these little insights. So four hundred again of that one show, but we have other shows, so it's probably it's a, a thousand total. Dude. If you can believe that, it's I, believe, crazy. I can't believe it. So to be I can't even imagine getting up to a hundred right now because I think I'm on seven or eight, and I, you do them every week, right? Yeah, Once exactly. A week. So you. Uh, I somebody said it. Shane Dorian said he won't do years until you hit a hundred episodes. Is that uh, true? No. You know what's funny is uh, he says that on Joe Rogan, and all my friends said it. They're like, "Oh, dude, he's talking about you." And I go, "I don't think so. I oh, think he's okay. talking about someone else." Okay. But uh, I wouldn't ask. See, Shane's one of those guys that I can get on tomorrow if I wanted to. But I don't. I kind of want to prove to my friends. That's kind of one of I've always done, especially with the older brother guys that are surfers like Slater and. Williams and all the dudes is except Kalani. Kalani's the same age as me and stuff. But those are like the older brother guys, and they always give me shit. They're always like, you know, all, and no matter what I do, like I'm doing stand up now and everything, and that they kind of been really encouraging because they know how scary that one is. But every I started a restaurant. I, mean, I didn't start a restaurant. Excuse me. I took over a restaurant. All these ventures I go on. All my really established friends, like Shane Doran, for one is kind of not they're not judgmental but they're very big brothery about it so when i heard that on joe rogan i was like it sounds like it's so me but i don't really do think it is but that's how it is with shane you know he wants to see me do it and do it well and then he'll represent what i'm doing but he'll be the first one to say like until you take it serious i'm not gonna go so it could be me and i <laughs> when i have dorian on my podcast i'm gonna ask like was that me yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the 101 show right, right, right. <laughs> but yeah it's I, I love that about my friends that's why i've been able to achieve kind of a lot of goals that i put out there is my friends are gangster when it comes to uh finishing what you start and i'm try trying to teach my little brother that more than anything is when you start anything whether it's washing dishes in a restaurant finish it well finish it it's uh, really easy for a lot of younger kids right now that I'm seeing that want to just start something and be like, woo. And then the next day they're like, never mind, I hate that. Woo. And then it just goes and goes and goes. And then they're 35 years old and they're like, what am I going to do? Yeah. You know, you have to, I do everything until the end, which is scary because a lot of it I want to run from. Like, you know, from friends passing away to doing stand up has been the scariest. I'm doing Belly Up the 27th and 28th of this month with Donovan Frankenreiter. I'm opening for him. And there's 600 people, right? It, it's a uh, it holds 600 people. I did it in New York, and there were 65 people. I right? saw that, yeah. And so the, my friend, that's a comedian in New York, he goes, "Don't do it." He goes, like I told him, I, I texted him, I said, "Hey, I'm doing this gig," and he goes, "How many people?" And I go, "600." And he goes, "No, no, 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 no." But no, 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 no. And I go, "What?" And he goes, "That's too many people." He goes, "There's going to be people in the back screaming and yelling and talking and getting drinks. There's going to be people shouting." And he's like, "It'll be really hard to get your humor across. It's going to be very distracting and this and that. And it's just too loud." And I was like, "Oh no!" <laughs> I was like, "No, I'm on the poster. Like I can't get out of it." So crash and burn like Maverick. I really, really don't mind. Well, I think failing is an accomplishment in itself. Can you do gigs until then? Well, that's what I have to do, but I've been doing it with my friends. Like I did Scott Eastwood, a podcast the other day, and he goes, I was talking about acting, and I said, 
I said, you know, I'm really scared. I just really want to get more reps, but I don't like doing open mics because it's just as scary as the real thing, which is kind of the reason why I should do them. But uh, he goes, a better thing to do, which I do with acting classes, is just bring like 10 of your best friends or people you like. Have a barbecue, have a few drinks, and just try your set over and over and over. Even if it's three times in one night with your friends, they're going to be the best critics. They're going to be like, dude, don't do that one or yeah. do that. And then it's not stressful. And, and so I always do it in front of my my girlfriend and her friends and stuff. And I did it. I did a joke on my podcast, which I hope is it came off okay with Perry Farrell. He goes, let me hear one of them. So I did my hiccup joke. And, uh, you know, you're looking at your one of your heroes, icons, and you're telling this joke. And I'm like so stressed out, but I'm getting used to it yeah. to a point where if someone goes, hey, tell me a joke. I'm like, all right, fuck you. Let's go. Knock, knock. Who's there? And then, you know, I fart. <laughs> <laughs> So you actually have a routine that you've crafted. Yeah, well, see, okay. in New York when I did it, I was so scared about the jokes that I wrote that I the night before I couldn't sleep. I told my girlfriend after, I said, you don't know how many times the day I finished, I finally did it. I, I told her that whole day I wanted 15 different things that I was going to make an excuse not to do it. And I told her after, I go, you don't understand. Like, remember when we ate breakfast and I was like, I don't feel good. I was making excuses the whole day, yeah, the whole day. Yeah, yeah. And at the very end of the day, right before I was five o'clock, I had to be there at seven. I remember going, the guy won't mind. The guy's my friend. The guy that owns the comedy. St like, I'm good. Like, I'm just going to say, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. Right. And I, it's like a lesson to everyone out there doing anything terrifying, which is the best thing you can do is everything that scares you. You need to go straight for it is you're going to doubt yourself till the last second. I mean, you might even doubt yourself while you're doing it, which I luckily did it because I made a, a executive decision in the backstage when the guy was announcing me. He goes, I go, fuck it. I'm just going to do funny stories. I go, because I had so much material about New York already just from being there for the week. And I was like, okay, okay, fuck it. I'm just going to be funny. So I shined the jokes and just came out and just went off the cusp and said everything that resembled humor in New York that week and this and that. And I started doing tangents about, you know, Iranian food and all, just all kinds of stuff. And the guy that ran the whole comedy show, he's like, dude, you didn't even tell jokes. But everyone loved it. Everyone's laughing and high five me and yeah, everyone yeah. liked it. But he's like, you got to do, you got to have a routine, man. He's like, and I, I go, I'm not a ballerina, a dancer. I'm just funny. And, he, and then I, I had to dwell on it. And then I took the criticism and I was angry and I was like, dude, maybe I didn't do it right. And I realized the routine has to be set in stone because I'm doing two shows in New York again next month. And now I have my hiccup joke. I got my North County joke ready because I'm doing it in Solana <laughs> Beach. I got so many avocado meets the toast and the freaking pickle meets the ball. And van Rob life. Machado is sleeping in your... What's that? Van life. Yeah, There's a whole oh, van life oh, genre shit. you could... Maybe I, I need to put the big yeah. van. What are those things called? Sprinters. Yeah, exactly. So it's where the sprinter meets the surf. I mean, it really is going to be a North County meltdown. Either they're going to love me or hate me, but it's going to be funny. They, they have a sense of humor. Yeah, so I'm... And Robin Chad is going to be there, and he's not going to like how many Robin Chad jokes I have. Um, and so I'm going to have jokes, and I'm going to have a routine, because I do back-to-back -back nights, and I'll be able to know by night two which, which jokes work and what didn't. So, well, you, so you've done one show? I've done two shows in my life. But crazy. And in New York. So New York was, my <laughs> the guy that ran the show, he's insane. He's from the Jimmy Fallon show. He's the talent director. Gotcha. And he's super honest. And he actually gave me some criticism right out, right when I got on stage. I was like, what? And I went home like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, motherfucker. And it burned in my soul. But it was like, oh, that's exactly what it was like when you're trying to be in a pro surfer or being, you know, uh, the host at Surfer Pole and everyone has something to say. And you're yeah. like, oh, that hurt, you know? But then 10 people say how great it was. But that yeah. one motherfucker. Of course. He's like, dude, your shoes look, you know, you're like, what? A shoe? Uh, but yeah, it was, it was you, this guy and he goes, <laughs> he goes, you know, you know, you, you just did comedy in New York. And I go, I know, right? And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, I'm saying it wrong. He goes, he goes, now you, you can do comedy anywhere. And I go, what does that mean? And he goes, so you don't realize, but if you start your comedy in New York or Boston, there's a couple places. If you do it there first, when you travel, they'll let you do it. And I go, what? And he goes, yeah. He goes, it's like, 
and he he like put it into terms. It's like if you played bit uh, if you're in a band and you played like the Hollywood Bowl first. Now you can go to Belly Up and dance naked. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter. Like you have the reference. And I was like, oh no way. So when I got home, I felt like I, I can do it. I can do it here. And then so yeah. anyway, that's why I said okay to Donovan because he's my biggest component of like he got he got the gig going right out of the gates. He's like, I got all the tickets. You're opening for me. How much time do you want? How much? And he's just you know Donovan's the man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. love him. Um, what's your end goal for comedy? Do you want to actually tour and do stand up? I want to do it until I'm not interested in it. Um, but like, I don't have, that's why I think the podcast and maybe the stand up will work for me because I don't want a dollar from either one of them. And all I want to do is get good at that craft because that's what intrigues me. That's why I'd, I never wanted to win surf contests. I wanted to put tracks down with good music because that attracted me with the comedy. I've always been really outgoing and silly. So I want to see where that can take me. And I like comedy writing. So like, that's why the last couple of weeks I've been getting more into the writing part. Luckily these phones are just talking to them, which is so much better than totally. just, by the time I type halfway through, I'm like, what was I thinking? But uh, I do the voice memo and I get all the jokes out, but I want to start writing for other things, other projects and other people and stuff. Cause voice memoing for voice other memo projects. For, and then like, <laughs> exactly. you can't write it. you're like, Hey, I wrote this all out for you. He's like, it looks like well, you just, just sang listen. It. Just listen. Why are you singing in the middle of it? <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think that's the, the real end goal for me is writing for comedy, maybe sense. shows, skits, uh, you know, stuff like that. Maybe even, I like, have a lot of movie ideas, just, just kind of do stuff like that. But even that, I don't want any money. Uh, don't, don't be so opposed to money. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, well, the, the, my the, crystal lady says I'm about to jump into some money because I picked out this rock that said like, let's go oh, sweet. too legit to quit kind sweet. of thing. I was like, well, I'm just rock? saying it's great that you don't, that you're not motivated by the money. However, the money allows you to continue to do the totally. thing. Totally. Like I still got to pay my director girl. Totally. So I need to make money for that. Yeah. I told her though, like whatever money we make, she can have 50% of it no matter what, because she's just as you yeah. know, responsible. But um, the end goal being with comedy and, and sorry, my podcast, the podcast thing is different than the comedy because the comedy is more like self-reflective of like myself. The podcast is about the other people, which I have so many, uh, my life is a movie. That's the movie I actually made back in uh, 2008 or 2009. Because my life is, everyone, all my friends would be like, your life's like a movie. Because it would be like the Julia Roberts would come in and we'd do a walk off like Zoolander in front of all my friends. Like, what is happening? Right. And all these random things happen to me because my life is just, really blessed in that way so the podcast is like all i gotta do is just keep dreaming up all these scenarios and they keep happening and just let it go and then the other people will jump on board because they see it working and hopefully that'll let be me, the race let me offer you some perspective um i grew up watching like i knew who you were when i was getting into surfing right i so i'm a fan of yours let's did you say. grow up in cali yeah southern california my whole life so i was watching the taylor Steele movies and all that stuff from the mid 90s onward mm-hmm. Currently, there's very little way to engage with you as a surf fan. Instagram is great, sure. But for all these other guys, I've had these touchstones throughout the years right. where it's like if, if I'm not actively trying to keep touch with them, Shane Dorian's being fed to me by all these other things. Mm-hmm. So the podcast is a great way for you to engage with the audience who wants to engage with you right. on a weekly basis. Totally. And social media is great too, but I think I don't think you're too active on social media. No, I'm not at no, right. I'd never. So you're no. not really doing that thing. But the reality is you have fans from all these different areas now who kind of want these regular engagements from you. And so think of the podcast as that way. It's an yeah. ongoing conversation that yeah. you could be engaging with your audience. And I think stand up is an extension of that. Yeah. So you can continue doing that too. Yeah, I agree. Like it brought me back in the light, I guess you could say. Totally. Drive through this last year. We exactly, brought that yeah. back. And uh that was, I mean, you, I can't. Give me the story of how that even came back. Dude, I, to be honest. Oh, the and dra- I'll tell you real quick. I'll interrupt you again. Um, I grew up loving that. It was such a fun series. And when I saw that it was being redone, I was nostalgic about it, but also a little bit apprehensive of right. like, dude, terrifying. well, now we're going to have these 40 year old dudes going dude. on a road trip. Fuck yeah. Like, yeah. is this actually going to be entertaining <laughs> every time? And then the episode shows up and it's 30 minutes long. And I'm like, I don't want to take 30 minutes. Within a minute, I'm fully engaged into it. By the end of the 30, I'm like, give me 30 more. <laughs> and they're as good as they used they, to be. I think, yeah, I, I hate to say that they're, they're better because I haven't watched one of the old ones forever. But I was like, I got, I can't, this is a really cool topic, to be honest. I've never spoke about it. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Because just like you said, I'm in my 40s and I haven't 
surfed for five years. I would say by the no day, the way. first day we went on and Ventura was this big, it was the first time I stood up on a surfboard and I, and I, this is hard to say to the public because I lied to all my friends and said I've been right. surfing. Totally. I wasn't surfing. I was really depressed and very, very over the, the whole concept of being a pro surfer because I was done with it. And when you're done being a pro surfer, 38 is when I got my last paycheck from Analog when they just, they, they didn't go out of business, but they shut down the whole surf thing. Channel Islands I still rode for, but all my sponsors were with Burton. And so they all kind of shut their doors and I was like, I'm not. And then I got offered from, I can't really say the name because I don't want to make them feel stupid, but they gave me a, a pretty good offer to be a pro surfer still. And I was like, huh. Clothing I, company? It was a clothing company. Okay. One here. And I was like, and it was a good money. It was more than a school teacher makes. And I was like, fuck. And I went, you know, I don't want to do that. I go, I've, I've all, my whole life, I've always watched guys that are in their late 30s or in 40s. And I'm like, dude, give it up. You know, like I'm the most critical person ever. So when he said, no one wants to watch it in 40s, dude, WSL was telling me and Donovan that. No one wants fucking Mick Fanning. I mean, that's another story that I'll go into in a second. So I was so freaked out that I couldn't surf. I didn't practice. I didn't do anything because I was just, it was, I was shocked that we were going to do it. I was laughing. I was going, this is going to be so sick. Hang up the phone and be like, oh, fuck. What am I really doing? Like yeah. you, it, being in front of a surf camera men in a, a, a production company is one of the most stressful things you'll ever do in your life because every second they're judging you. Every second you're on a wave, every second you're on the beach, every second you're doing something, you're being judged and you have five angles of it and they want you to make a mistake because that's funny. Mm -hmm. So you're like, I'm like, do I want this? Do I really want to be this guy again? It's um, I, I don't know if I can because now I've gone on the threshold of that confidence that I used to have. Now I'm an older guy that's like out of shape, doesn't serve, doesn't, I mean, being a pro surfer is one of the hardest things you could do mm -hmm. physically and mentally, right? So I'm now at this point where I'm sitting in meetings and this is the story of why it came back. I'm running my restaurant in Hawaii. Donovan calls me once every seven years. <laughs> I mean, really, literally, it's, it's every fucking five years, maybe. And I get three missed calls. And I'm up in Mililani, because I live in Hawaii. And I'm up in Mililani uh, getting lunch. And my phone, I feel it vibrating, but I'm kind of not really paying attention. Three missed calls from Donovan Frankenreiter. I'm like, huh? And I'm like, must be butt dials. So I call him, and he goes, are you fucking kidding me? Woo! And he's doing his whole Donovan thing. I'm like, what's up, man? I miss you. And he goes, are you sitting down? And I go, no, it doesn't matter. I had never, you know, I'm antsy, motherfucker. And, I'm, and he goes, we're bringing the drive through back. And, and this is 10 years in the making of him texting going, dude, you, how many texts do you get from people on Instagram? And I'm like, every single one is bring back the drive through to me. And I'm always just like, ah, I can't do it. It's, and then the 10 years went by and I'm like, of course we're not doing it. Now we're the 40 year old <laughs> dorks, right? So next thing you know, he caught, he says, Hey, WSL's buying it or bought it from fuel TV. And I go, what's that mean? And WSL has always hated me anyway, just cause I'm not a competitive guy. And I always are just silly and they're all serious and there's earphones and fizzle balls and I'm running around nude and shit. So uh, they go, we want to have a conference call, but Donovan's goes, they wanted to do it with these people. But I said, it has to be Greg Browning, Taylor Steele and you, or we're not doing it. And I was like, cool, man, I'm in. So then WSL comes in and wanted to do, we did it. Like, I, I can't say the budget, but like a hundred grand they spent <laughs> on just me and Donovan doing the making, uh, excuse me, the, the intro. So it was like a Quentin Tarantino intro we shot here at Donovan's mansion that he just bought. That's some of the bitch. And we did a whole thing where it's like, we're bringing, what we're, and Donovan does this <laughs> COVID thing where he's in his house, but has sourdough bread for days and toilet paper everywhere. Like he hasn't left the house in years. And he's like, he's looking at magazines. He's like, oh man, he sees like dirty dancing CDs. And he's like, oh man. Oh, and he sees a drive through one. And he's like, oh my God, do you imagine bringing this back? And then he calls Slater. He calls Pat O'Connell. He calls Machado. And everyone's like, dude, that's so old. No one's going to watch that shit. And then all of a sudden he goes, Benji. And then I'm in a bunker hitting golf shots. We <laughs> shot it with like red cameras and fucking, we had six people there with lighting. It was crazy. Excuse me. And so... I'm in the bunker and I make singing hit and my phone rings and I'm like, Donnie, what up? And he's like, we're bringing it back. And that was the opening, right? So we're like, oh, this is going to be so sick. And, and then the WSL only had nine days to make it. And they wanted to make it from Northern Cal down to the lowers contest at the end of the year in nine days. 
and they wanted to put a crew together that was a girl surfer, which is an amazing surfer. She's like winning contests and stuff. She's an awesome surfer. And then they wanted a guy from a reality show to come in from The Bachelor that's a really handsome guy. And they had a, a crew that they wanted. And we were like, no, 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 no. They missed the point. They, I was like, no, 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 no. You guys, I go, I, got, I talked to Mick Fanning yesterday and he's in. And the guy, <laughs> this is when I knew we were fucked. He goes, no one wants to watch 40-year-old surfers. And I'm, he's talking about Mick Fanning, right? Not yeah. just me. Obviously, right. no one wants me. I, that's <laughs> right, right, the greatest right. part about it. I don't give a fuck about my surf. How if people see see how like oh he's not as good as he used to be. Of course, I'm not. I don't care. If I cared, I maybe is maybe still ripping, but who cares? And looking <laughs> when he said that about Mick Fanning, I was like, oh no, we're fucked. Because it was supposed to be about the world's best. We always had the iconic guy. So you're like, dude, you just wanted to watch Aki put his wetsuit on. Like, that's what was so dope about it. The videos it, weren't about the it quality It wasn't about of the age or ripping or eat, yeah. and all that stuff. So I was like, no, no, no. You, I, and then he goes, it's already done. And he goes, you can't. And we already signed the thing. So I was like, oh, no, we're not going to do this the right way. And Donovan's like, we're out of here. He goes, he called me right after the conversation. He goes, I, we're not doing it. He's like, if we're going to bring these random people and it's not random in a sense. Like, there's a girl is an amazing surfer. But we didn't have girls on it before. And it's such a dude cruise, not to take away from the DC movie, but it was such a dude cruise that I didn't think it would work. And it wouldn't have. And so, and we needed more time. And we wanted to do the United States. We wanted to go to the wave pools. We didn't have anything set up. And we were just like, oh, my God, this is going to fail. And then I made a comment in a Zoom call, which I think is out there enough for I me to talk about. might have reported And on I got a little bit canceled by the WSL because I said something and they were like, you know, you can't say that kind of stuff. And it was just in a Zoom call. So I thought I was just off the cusp, but uh, the HR department, WSL is such a big corporation, they can't mess around. And there, no no problem between me and the WSL because they saved it. They saved it by doing that. Right. Because we- It was a dick the, joke, right? On it his, was a dick joke. Yeah. I made a dick joke about Kelly's phone or something. Yeah, yeah. And it really was harmless, but I get it. Like, they saw it as liability for putting this guy on camera. And we have they have so many corporate sponsors that they're like, dude, if we make this, this show and he's out there making jokes like that, we can all get canceled. It is what I, the consensus is, is what I come up with, which is totally fine. And it, I got to be honest, my potty mouth saved the drive-thru. So they all owe me. Every one of my friends owes me at least a beer. And um, and the WSL is still, you know, one of the coolest brands out there. And it just wouldn't have worked because well, we have to have me shitting on the side of the road when we fucking couldn't stop. And we need to be able to, you know, have the opening scene where fucking Griffin gets pants. Right. Like I want that has to be the way. And we came up with the coolest um like kind of like defense of the whole needs to have women in it and stuff. When we were in the East coast of this drive through, we had the four goats. Like we had Carissa Moore, Lisa Anderson, uh, Carol Marks and Sage Erickson all in track suits saying, we need to do a women's drive through and we own it now. Like we're the producers and we actually own the whole thing. We're like, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to make the coolest drive through with all the best girl surfers yeah. and have like Laura Enever as like the Benji, you know, yeah. like fucking and shit in her pants. Oh, well, Laura, I know you're not shitting your <laughs> pants, but maybe you could just for the show. That'd be awesome. Um, but yeah, it's just like, wouldn't that just be the coolest thing? Yeah. Especially because the little girls would be like, we have our own drive through. So I don't know. I just, it kind of worked out good that I had a potty mouth, but at the same time, I regret being so loose that the WSL told well, me to F off. No, I think you, you were in the right. And the WSL shuttered WSL studios yeah. since then. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it, I think they've kind of time and time again, missed the point, like the essence of what was the drive through, they don't see. Right. And they're trying to drive this other agenda right. and missing the point entirely. Totally. You know? And, yeah. When they told us, so Donovan, I, like we need you to know that these are, this is what we're doing on the drive through. And Greg Browning saying, no, you don't understand. This is in our Zoom, one of our Zoom calls. You don't understand. We we just let the surfers do what they want that day. They say, "Oh, I'm going to go rock slide this thing, go over to this house and have a barbecue, get drunk, and then surf at five in the morning to this day. whatever we want to do." They just film it. Yeah. And Greg, the creator and the the goat of the drive through, the reason why it all happens is telling WSL like this is how we do it, and they're like, "No, no, 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 no. We don't do it that way. We produce everything and we direct it." And we and we were like, "Oh Man. no, we're, you guys don't understand. You guys bought this idea, this concept." And spent so and, much and yeah money. and you guys have the idea you bought it you bought the idea and you want to change it and i was like oh this isn't going to be good but so then how uh, did the thing the distribute how did distribution come together because it was on fuel for a bit 
and then stab got involved at some yeah, point. So we, How did that yeah, all work? We were, out? we're, you know, we didn't even break even, which is sad. But at the same time, we, I've never made money from the drive through. <laughs> I've been really? on ten of them, never made a dollar. Oh uh, well, I think Fuel paid the riders, me, Aki, and Andy Irons and stuff, uh, like five or ten grand one. Because it was the it was the last one we did. Where Andy, it was, it was like, like a right series. before Andy passed. It was our last drive through. We all got a little coin, just a little bit. Basically, paid for the trip. But this one, we didn't have time to get sponsors because we were just scrambling. We just wanted to get it out there and do it the best we can with shoestring budget. And um, you know, we we the, we didn't get to pay the surfers, which we really, really, really want to pay Griff and Parker and Eric and everybody, but. We're hoping that the next one we make, we have more time to get sponsorships. And what, like you were saying, a Stab stepped up, um, gave us a little bit of coin to pay off. And we have a few sponsors like Pedal. And, you know, we had a GoPro, maybe? We had GoPro and we had Seaborn cocktails. And we had, you know, we had a few sponsors that got us to the finish, uh, finish line. But it was definitely really hard without Stab and Fuel. And Fuel. Got to release it first, but then they gave us the rights to it after that. So now this next one, we're going to go after a live stream. And I want YouTube. Well, that's what I want. But it's going to be all of our money up front. We're going to have to got create. It. But I like YouTube because the only people that come up to me like, dude, the new drive through is sick, are the people that say they saw it on YouTube. I'm like, oh, really? You saw it on YouTube? What about Stab? And they're like, oh, I never got that. But I Because the you know, YouTube's the short version. It's, it's not the, even the full The first episode. episode's free. Okay. On on YouTube, and then every episode after gets like five or six minutes. Right. And every time I watch it, <laughs> that's where I watch it too. To be honest, because I don't have I don't have cable. I have YouTube. Every <laughs> but time you don't have YouTube, Stab Premium. Drive through. I'm all sick, and then it ends after the first scene. I'm like, ah. Is it isn't it a different cut on YouTube, or is it just I the first? I think five it's minutes? just a short cut of it, like yeah, a six okay. minute cut. But um, YouTube is like all my friends overseas. I my know. Grandma, well, like I everyone agree. watches you'll YouTube. Get, you'll get the most eyeballs on YouTube, but will you see the return on the investment? Not really. Exactly. Oh, we'll see. That's that's so, something that so I. So you got to let's figure out this model. Yeah, we got to figure out the model. It's got to be it's sell I, to like a streaming service. I'm assuming, right? That would probably that, be the best. Yeah, that would like probably a Hulu be Hulu or something. Yeah, Netflix something or, like that. Or Stab has also grown a lot with their premium model, and so maybe by Hopefully, next season, I'd be interested. They can fund something like. I'd this. be interested to see if Stab how many views they got off of what we did with them and see if they want to still do it for the next season i think greg said they're in for the next one as well but for the same number or for a new number because well, it make, couldn't be the same number because it was you it was make, less than our cocktail yeah, sponsor you know? there you go so, so what about i know fuel was launching their um their app basically subscription app mm -hmm. and so they were using this as an opportunity to like hey let's get happens, yeah right? let's get users onto our platform here's a new series we have right so well, did I'd they get? Did I'd they get enough I've users? I've never talked to Fuel. I've okay. never talked to okay. Greg Browning's in charge of all that. Got it, got it, got it. But he never comes and tells our group. We had a conference the other day about the new one. We're we're trying to do Japan next, not to let the cat out of the bag. But, um, and he was saying that, uh, like he didn't bring up the fact that we crushed it on this or crushed on that. It was just let's do it. for all of us. It's put our head down and do it again. And we have luckily we have Blair Marlin and Greg Fernandez and a bunch of guys that can get us title sponsors and all that stuff so we're working on that now okay good but we we've created something that works and for me and donovan the terrifying um idea of us being old and shitty at surfing and and you know being what we are like an old walrus looking human being with this thing and stuff um <laughs> we were all so scared of it and thinking what are people gonna think are they even gonna like it are they gonna think like we're you know this or that and then we saw the dynamic with the younger kids and we realized, like, it works. It totally worked. Like, it still does. Yeah. I, I would be the first one to be like, turn it off right now. This is embarrassing. But I was like, it's so good. And getting Dane, I mean, that was so cool. Yeah. Getting Dane just legitimized everything. Like, him being in the tracksuit in Santa Cruz and the local kids coming up to him, Dane, Dane. And, and he, they'd be like, what's dry through? And, you know, there's young kids. And he's like, it's the coolest thing going right now in surfing. And I look at Donovan and I'm like, that is the coolest thing I've ever heard in my life. That's hilarious. Because I'm, I'm, similar to dane that i'm like i love surfing but it's there's so much about it i wish was different and i loved the you know letting letting like back when i was a kid guys were fucking loose man like gerlach and all those guys were really really characters and they were fun and they pushed the envelope of reality and like taking things so far that you're like what i mean robbie page and these were crazy men they were madmen right now that everyone's got their shit so tight that i feel like we're in a sport you yeah, know this totally. isn't a sport i know gabriel medina is the best athlete in the world 
straight up. Yeah. I've never seen a competitive surfer that good ever. And I never will probably. He's the GOAT is competitive surfing. GOAT, Kelly, you got it, but yeah. you're not as good a contest surfer as Gabriel. And uh, so now we have this competitive sport, which I love to death, to be honest. I like having both sides of it. We lost this side, though, of comedy and just silliness and going surfing to get away from sports. That's what I did it for. That's why when I see guys with fizzle balls and they walk by the kids with their earphones with seven boards, with their coach and their manager and their family and everyone, and you're like, we're kind of lost what surfing is with that aspect. But then when I watch it, that level, the progression, it's so exciting, and I can't hate on it. It's so good. Uh, yeah, you can't, but I just wonder how much fun they're actually having. And yeah. I think Gabriel Medina's last year or two, that's really become a question, right. which was his parents were creating this robot right. who happened to be the best surfer in the world, but at what cost? You know, yeah. if you're not that's enjoying That's a really it. good point to what I'm saying. It's like, yeah. I know for a fact I had more fun on my 28 years as a pro surfer. I, I actually am guilty of of kind of like being <laughs> being a fraud in a sense that I got away with just being myself and having fun and creating clips, but then creating a, a kind of like a culture in my own self to people can follow and be like, you know, that's kind of where I want to be. I want to be not taking myself serious and I want to go surfing when I feel like it and I want to progress in a way with style and, you know, just a, I had my own way of doing it and it worked for me. And I yeah. see these competitive guys, I, I, I just, it does seem torturous. Like, you see Julian, it looks like the life was taken out of him, dude. Totally. Like, when, that's one of my favorite and surfers. he's such and a looks, good surfer. He's, I mean, how is he not world champ? It's crazy. So it's crazy. It's hard to, for me to so, see that. So I think your legacy can help. History will tell. Your legacy in the surf world will be uh, the first legitimate pro surfing comedian. Oh, that so, would be a good one. So... <laughs> Raglan Surf Report couldn't have existed, can't exist today without you having led the way. Sterling Spencer couldn't have existed well, without love, you leading the and way. And you know what's great about him is I, I absolutely, that I, te I always text him side text like, dude, please don't stop. Just keep well, going. Well, he did for a bit. I know, because I didn't know he had his, inst I didn't know anything about it really. I just always, I did one of his videos back in the day as a bouncer. And I'm like, what is this for? You know, because yeah, it was yeah, before yeah. all the stuff. It was pinch myself. It was at his, you know what I'm talking That's about? That's what it used to be called. Okay, yeah, so blog. I did it and I heard it was so funny. And I never watched it. I was, that was right when I was getting out of pro surfing. So I was like, whatever, everything. And then I found out he had his Instagram. And when I see him, he's so mellow, you know? Yeah. And I'm always just like, this is the funny guy. You know, like I've always thought that. I'm like, is Sterling's funny? And then when I started, I, I followed him, I don't know, month, two months ago. And his like little belly and his whole thing. And I'm like, oh, thank you, God. I texted him and said, hey, please keep it going. There's nothing like you right now. I'm like... I wish there was more of Sterling it's Spencer's. So good. It's so he's funny. come back stronger. Yeah. Oh, it, you know what? I gotta admit, his video with the back in the day, a rap video or something he made. Remember with the girl with the big butt? Oh, it was called Gold. The, it was like a thirty-minute video. Genius, dude. Rob Machado was a big character. Oh, in okay. That. Well, I didn't see the whole movie, but I saw the. It was like a music part. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it yeah. was so. And Bob Saget was funny. in it. Yes. He was, huh? Yeah. I got to go back and rewatch it. The Saget that. bit is incredible. Wait a second. Because it's, it's through there. So shit. Saget's his surfboard shaper. And through, How did he get that Saget? I don't know. That's there insane. is a story there. I forget what that was. But it's him going in to see a surfboard shaper. And through the conversation, that he, he connects, Sterling connects the dots, <laughs> that Bob Saget's his dad. <laughs> no, I got to go home and watch this. It's so, I'll send it to you so afterwards. That's what I, when I saw that, I was like, oh, he's hilarious. But then, I, like you said, I didn't see anything for a long time. But it, yeah, we need more. It took, a ten year, it took a 10 year hiatus. Yeah. Um, so let's go back a little bit um, between leaving, taking that last paycheck until now, like kind of getting re-involved in surfing through the drive through and everything else. Um, do you, do you wish you would have parlayed? Do you wish you would have not taken that time off? Do you wish you would have parlayed that pro surf thing into kind of what you're doing now without the break in between no and you know it's it's so easily told my story i love it now my story before was something I'd, i wasn't proud of as crazy as that sounds like the momentum generation being a pro surfer for 28 years people always coming up dude my favorite part was the good times or you know all those things always made me feel good it always made me feel good. I'd be like, cool, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. But I never felt any kind of happiness that I got from owning a restaurant. And what I mean by that is I was living in Bali. 
Um, and I was just about to start a beer company with Rizal. And I was had my own place there. And it was like I had I was selling my house in Lucadia and I was gonna have a chunk of money. And I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna build this life in Bali. Right. My mom and my uncle were owners of breakers in Haleiwa. And my mom's everything in my life to me. And my uncle got in an accident, crashed his car, was in a coma, and there was a really good chance he wasn't going to make it. So my mom and I talked, and I said, you know what, I'll come home and, and figure this out with you. Got home and found out she was a half a million dollars in debt, and that she was going to lose the restaurant, be based, not homeless, but no money, out on the, and really far in debt, no, no credit, nothing. So I sold my house. And my uncle ended up passing away. So for six months, we didn't have a liquor license because it was under his name. I had to get all that stuff taken care of. And I didn't know how to work. And, and this is the crazy part for people out there that can only comprehend how crazy this is. But I never had a job. I never had a job. 14 years old, Gotch is like, hey, guess what? You're traveling. And from 14 to 38, never worked a day in my life, right? And I mean, you, you, a lot of people will be like, you've never even worked, but the, I've, you know, had a production company and I had to wake up every morning and try to be the best surfer in the world and travel all year round and do all those things. It's work, but it's not work. Yeah. You know, it's a different, different work. It's harder than work. That's what's what people don't realize when people are like, yeah, but you never went to work at 6 a.m. and then work till five. I loved that part of it because I was like, there's no one judging me. There's, there's no life threatening thing all day long. It's, it's just work. So I went, I learned how to wash dishes, I learned how to cook on the line, I learned how to bartend, I learned how to serve, I learned how to manage, I learned how to inventory and weighing food and designing menus. And for four and a half years, I've fired people and got almost in fist fights with employees. Hawaii, dude, imagine owning a restaurant in Hawaii. Well, we were talking about surfers that would walk in and be like, dude, I need a job, can I have money right now? And I'd be like, what? And right. then they would leave that night and I'd never see him again. It was right. just incredibly difficult, but I did it. And I kept the name, nostalgia, and everything. And I went from a really gross karaoke bar to it's a really cool family restaurant, which we're absolutely crushing it now. My mom's taken care of. Everything is running. It's pain for my life even right now. Amazing. Like I have no income coming from anywhere else but this restaurant right now. So it's it's the biggest accomplishment I ever had. And it made me handle that five years of not being in surfing. It, it actually made it better because now I have knowledge. I understand how to manage people. I know how to manage myself. I know how to deal with finances. I didn't even know how to, I had an accountant that did everything. Now I actually write checks and do payroll and I learn how to work, right? Wow. So when I did all that, now it's like, oh my God, everything is easy. Like everything, like people are like, what are you gonna do now? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. I can start shaping again. I can, now I have a podcast and I'm sure I could probably make money eventually from these two little ventures being stand up and stuff. But more than anything, I, I can do anything. So now I wanna start a cocktail company called Breakers. I might even open a re restaurant in San Diego called Breakers South. And that is the best thing that could have happened at the end of my career. Because a lot of my friends, no names that need to be said, but that were pro surfers on my level, would go into gnarly depression, try to kill themselves. I mean, it's it's a really dark place. And I luckily have such good family and good friends and lucky I have a good head on my shoulder. And I didn't mind working. And I, I, I love working. It's so much easier than waking up and having people film you and go like, rip. And if you don't rip, you're just sitting in your own shit all day. Like, I'm not good. I'm horrible. I'm never going to be, you know, like that. Yeah. The feeling of being a pro server is terrifying. Yeah. You're, you're like, next week I could be dropped. Next week this guy's going to tell me I suck and they're going to show a bad wave of me. So, right. yeah, it was a crazy transition, but the best one I could have had. Well, good job for stepping up to the plate and actually. Yeah, it's uh, fun. And I'm it. proud of my restaurant. Like, my friends all come in and I have nostalgia all over the walls of, like, the Eddie Cal winning board. And it represents my whole family of friends and surfers. And it just worked out perfect for me. Amazing. So And now I can live um, back here. I just got a place here. Oh, did you really? Yeah, I live in San, downtown San Diego. <laughs> Holy cow. Which is cool, man. I, I honestly make my house look like Ron Burgundy's house. And I live down there. And I'm, I'm I, every day I think I'm Ron Burgundy. So if you guys see me on the street, call me Ron and I'll be drinking milk. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of depression and kind of that transition in momentum generation you do open up about struggling with addiction oh heck yeah um still that's the most it, it, i haven't talked about it on any podcast i'm still struggling with drugs and alcohol alcohol is, is the main one for me but it's so and how they 
they've legalized weed. Uh. <laughs> uh, it, that's the craziest thing about it. I moved five years ago. When I moved, I had to buy weed from like random surfer dudes and I'd have to sit in their house for hours smoking bong ribs. Like, can I just buy the weed? Right, and then right. they would be like, all right, are you leaving? I'm like, oh. but uh, yeah. Hey, are you Ron Burgundy? <laughs> can I get a surfboard? I want food. You know, and uh, it's, it's the, but the, with the drugs and alcohol and stuff, when you're in it for so long, it is, it's, uh, it's such a, it's such a motherfucker that it's a daily thing. Uh, most addicts out there that can relate, it's a daily struggle that every single day I have to fight to not drink. Every day I have to fight to not do coke or weed or everything. And the thing is, is I use weed now as a medicinal, and because luckily the the people uh, that judge you the most are the ones that legalized it. So I'm I'm happy to say that. I've got no better grip on it, but there is no way in hell I'm going to control my life. And that's why being honest is the only way out of it. And I'm so brutally honest that it keeps the narrative light instead of dark. Yeah. If that makes sense. And like, I could always go to rehab and I can always do the things that I've done multiple times in my life. But now I try to do it with honesty with my partner or honesty with my friends and family. Cause I mean, there's friends like Slater and stuff that'll come get right in my face. We're me and Kelly are supposed to do a Bolga, Bolga, a Bolga. I don't know what that is. It's ayahuasca's big brother for okay. about addiction. Okay. It's really gnarly. And you, you um, go through a lot of str uh, pain and struggle in it, but it's very, very good for uh, addiction. And Kelly is one of my biggest components of trying to help. When I went to rehab, he was right by my side for 30 days, as I say in that documentary. And uh, it's just one of those things, like it'll never be an easy thing for me to do, but it is something that it's a daily thing and I'm way better. So <laughs> it sounds crazy, but just five years ago to today, I'm in a way better place. But I'm still struggling. I struggle every day. So let me ask you, um, a lot of people do use, let's say, drugs and alcohol just recreation or, quote, recreationally daily. When do you identify it as addiction and not serving you? Because um, I think a lot of people right now are listening and they don't think they're addicted. Yeah. And the people around them are maybe like, well, you missed work today or you bro your girlfriend no. broke up with you yeah. because of that. And so, no, no, totally. So how do you define it as serving you versus now? It's, oh man, that's such a good question because every addict wants to make sense Downplay of what they're it. doing. Yeah. Everyone. I, in the worst of the worst, are the ones that drink coffee and have their have their vices and they think that your vice is different, right? And that's that's the one thing as an addict, you always get kind of frustrated because you're always the bad one because your vice is uh, hated on by the public, if you will. And right, that sounds right, crazy, right. but we're legally allowed to drink alcohol, but if you do too much of it, you're a fucking weirdo. Uh, that's heartbreaking as an addict because you're like, I don't get it. You guys are telling me it's okay, but it's not okay. And you, so you're doing that. At the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is what do you want? Like, what do I want out of my life? So when I miss an appointment, like you said, or I broke up with a girlfriend and it might've had something to do with addiction or those, it was like, to be honest, it mostly is. It mm. usually is. But with that being said, if I was completely 100% sober, I'm still going to fight with my girlfriend. I'm still going to break up. I'm still going to do certain things that I do, but it never helps to be an addict. It always makes things confusing. But I think at the end of the day, it's what you want. I've accomplished all my goals, and I always do everything really well by being a functioning alcoholic. Like I'm a functioning alcoholic and addict, on a level where I only go so far because I know I can still get things done, but I'm still using it as what you said earlier. Um, it's treating me or uh, serving, it. serving me. And yeah. it serves me because I'm outgoing. I'm at parties. It gets me out and socializes. You know, a lot of what I do when it comes to substance is socializing. Like if I'm just by myself, I'm not really going hard in the paint. I usually go hard in the paint when I'm nervous or if I'm uh, around a lot of people. I usually like, that's when I, like my, I have crazy energy. And as you, if you know me, you know, if I'm not stoned or if I'm not drinking or all this stuff, I'm still really fucking gnarly. And I use a couple things and I need to use more meditative things and stuff that is way healthier. Exercise is the thing. That's why I told you earlier, I run. The only thing that's ever helped me is running. If I wake up, put my earphones in and run for four, you know, four or five miles, the day is so much better. 
my day has so much more clarity and understanding. And I to, for people out there struggling with um, addiction, if you just wake up and run <laughs> until you're so exhausted that all you want is an Asahi smoothie, because the thing is about addiction is you do it when you don't feel good because you want to feel good. So like if you wake up and you're hungover, the first thing you're going to do is go for a drink because you feel shitty. But if you wake up and you run and you're like, and your heart's racing and your brain's got oxygen and you're like, whoo, the last thing you want to do is drink. You're just like, why would I drink? I just fucking worked out. So my biggest thing obviously is talking with therapists and going to AA helps going and talking. And that's when I told you being honest helps is you have to talk about it. You have to, you have to relay to everyone that cares about you that you, you do understand where you're at. Like I do know I drank too much last night. I like to make jokes about it because I'm just a human being. And when you consider yourself not perfect, you can be honest, but when you think you're not doing anything wrong and you're in denial, nothing happens positive from that point. It always goes negative because you have these expectations that aren't real. The only thing real is waking up and being honest and going, the only way I'm going to get out of this fucking nightmare is to run. So that's kind of like the thing I've learned is exercise and being honest. Those are the two things I took away from getting better. Um, but I'm not perfect. <laughs> I'm really not. I'm you, fucked up. You talked about... Uh, being able to drink to a certain point, but still get things done. Mm -hmm. You stopped surfing for five years. How much was that related to Oh God, I, to be honest, probably 95%. Yeah. I mean, Do you regret the thing that? Is, is, I don't regret it because I had 28 years of surfing. But did you miss it? Do you think your life would be better if you had surfed those five years? I would say yes. I think no matter what, um, to be completely honest, Life is always better if you're surfing. That's how I feel. And yeah. and that's that's always going to be the case. But when you've done it for so long, I really wanted to tap in. Like when I did the Perry Farrell one the other day, he told me it was so cool. It's so cool when you hang out with people that you respect and when they say stuff, it means something. And it's going to be with me for the rest of my life. Because I always thought, and my all these friends would be like, dude, don't you want to be world champion? And I go, not really. I go, I, I never really saw myself as a world champion. I, I see myself as somebody that's funny and has his, has such a big heart that everyone goes, dude, I love that guy. I love that guy. And when I said that to Perry, I said, dude, you're a rock star. And he goes, no, I'm not. He goes, I'm, I want people to remember me as a surfer and a good person. And I went, Phew. I went, you couldn't have said it better because that's what I always wanted. I didn't want to be Benji Weatherly pro surfer. I want to be Benji Weatherly, the good human being. The person that people are like, dude, I want him to be at my wedding when he's 45 years old. I want him to be be my my daughter's goddaughter. Like when Kalani asked me to be his godfather, I was like, <laughs> like that's what meant more than any stupid surfing accomplishment. So when he, Perry Farrell said that, I was like, oh my God, here's a guy that could have been out of his mind, still rock starred out, but he's so grounded. He's 63, he surfs, he's healthy, he's happy. And he has... The he has the real root of what makes him happy, and that's not being a rock star. It's being a good person. Mm. So at the end of it, that's all I, I get out of my surf career is that I'm lucky enough to have all these people that teach me rad shit like that. And that's that's like Slater in a nutshell. The guy's so disciplined that he makes me feel like I'm an alien. Right. You know, everyone's like, he's an alien. But I'm like, no, I'm the alien, dude. Yeah. That guy doesn't even do anything except levitate and eat almonds <laughs> that aren't salted. Like, what the F? So. Um. Back so in that film, you told the story about um, Jeannie Chesser riding Todd's board at restaurants. Is that a true story? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if it wasn't. The cool I mean, part. The cool part about my life. It seems it's, it's so surreal, but I have all of it documented, right? So that's why, like, all my stories and shit seem surreal, but they're all documented and amazing. And that one is so close to my heart that seeing it in the big screen and all that stuff is mind boggling because that really happened in my life. And the cool thing is, is Jeannie eventually is going to be on my podcast. Like, why wouldn't she be? I just, I just incredible. thought of it just a second, She'd but why fantastic. wouldn't she be? And she will give that story out of her own mouth. And she's Todd Chesser, basically. She just as gangster as him. And she'll tell it in a different way because I'm a good storyteller. She's an honest storyteller. And it all happened the way I said, but her I her said it barrel? in a way. She's going to say it like... Yeah, I, I can't. I can't wait to hear what she says. But yeah, it happened that way, and it's just one of those moments that I still can't explain it. And it was special because Tavarua Cloudbreak, especially, was Chester's. That was his spot. 
like when we were kids and Dorian and uh, Brock Little got to go, they got 12 foot t- uh, cloud break. And it was before anyone got it that big. And Todd would tell me the stories. I, he was my last roommate, you know, and he would tell me those stories. I'd be like, Oh my God, 12 foot taboo. Oh my God. So right when he passed away, I, I wasn't close with Jeannie cause she had just worked at surf contest. I was an amateur. I was only 20 when this happened. And, uh, I just remember telling my mom, I remember it like it was yesterday. I only had $800 in the bank. I remember that because I made the quarterfinals at the PSA and at Seaside. And I had 800 bucks. And I told my mom, I, I need to borrow $400 and I'm going to take Jeannie Chester to Tavarua. And she goes, a woman? And I go, yeah. And she goes, you can't go to Tavarua with a girl. And I go, but she's 50 something years. Mom, I, it's my best. You know, she kind of went like, oh, okay, okay. I, I, I don't know why I'm tripping, but yeah, you're really going to do that? I'm like, yeah. And it happened in a way, because my mom is the person she is, that I didn't realize what I was doing. I, at the time, I was going on a dragon surf trip to Tavrua, and then all of a sudden, my best friend passes away, and I'm like, I'll still go on the trip, but I have to bring Jeannie. And all, of course, everyone was like, please bring her. But it was the hardest week of my life. She just had lost her son, and then she lost her husband. I don't know if you know the whole story, but Todd's dad died in Florida when he was three and in a car crash and Todd was in the car in a car seat and so she lost her husband and her son and she's sitting in my it was when Tabaru had just had the little huts with the water spout on the back and she just had a booklet of all the photos of her husband and, and Todd and every night she didn't sleep for oh man five days or six days and and she she went through the photos every day crying and asking me at 20 years old why 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 and I remember thinking how the fuck can I know that? And I, the one thing I knew at that moment was we'll never know the answer. And then the next day was when we were at breakfast and we fucking went out and we were sitting there and she, at this point she's weak. It's like day four or five and she hasn't really eaten or anything. And we're sitting at breakfast. And you know, if you've been to Tavro, you understand that you're just looking at the most perfect laugh in the world, but it's flat. And um, when it, we went out, it was a one footer that went through. And we're like, let's just go out. The tide was high. We're like, let's just go out and try to catch a couple. And we went out, and I remember she had her hat on, you know, that sun hat, because she had really gnarly skin. And we're just rash guard up, we're sitting out there, and then, like, you know the whole story, the waves started pumping. When we came in that night, she slept, man. She slept pretty unbelievably well, like, for her. It was like, I, I remember sleeping through the night and waking up, and she was still lying there, and I was like, fuck. And it was just one of those moments at 20 years old, I was like, I don't know why this is happening, but I do know that we're doing the right thing. We're honoring your son, and... You're right in his board, and the surf gods obviously love him, and he was a part of us for that day. And since then, she's gone back a bunch of times. And but that moment in time will never change because it's already then; it's done. And I have I have that moment in my heart forever. It's great. Does she still have that board? Oh yeah, she's got all Todd's boards. She never got rid of any. She keeps getting more. In fact, I found one on the East Coast that I'm going to pick up this summer. What? Yeah, they keep coming back to us, man. This one is one of his last boards, and this guy found it in Block Island. You know that place, Block yeah. Island? Yeah, yeah, And they found it two years ago, and they keep texting me, dude, we got this thing. We want to give it to Jeannie. So, and I looked at it and looked at the stringer and then sent it to her, and she goes, that's really one of his, because she airbrushed them, you know? Yeah, yeah. And she's like, that was one of the last ones I airbrushed, and so we're going to get that one to her. Another one came in. Slater got here in San Clemente. It was, a, I put it on my Instagram. It was like a local, mo- it was something, but it was Todd's when he was really young. Huh. So we're trying to get them all back, man. Incredible. So, yeah. yeah, that so that story was mind blowing. I did not I thought it could have been partially made up. There's a couple other stories no, in that film that are kind of made up. It doesn't up. even it doesn't even seem real. No, it, it doesn't. It, that, that story. And that's why I, I'm stoked you brought it up because I need Jeannie to back my story up. Yeah, yeah. Because that's what's so great. I think she says a get couple comments. She says like, Yeah, it was so sweet that he took me to Tabaru and all that stuff. But I definitely need to have her back my story up so it doesn't sound so bad. Or just up. to hear her perspective side inside yeah. of it and all that. Can you imagine going to Tavaro for 1200 bucks? Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> right? And that was, we got the discount. You got to understand, like, the guy Rick was the guy there, and he goes, he let her come back every year for, like, five, 600 bucks. But, yeah, you're right. I remember it being 800 or 1200 That's insane. <laughs> now it's that a day. Yeah. Um, totally random. Was... Blink 182's Mutt written about you? Yeah. Yeah, that's why I got to do Tom DeLonge's podcast coming up here sooner and later because I think I did a podcast the other day or something. Oh, the fucking, the stand-up dude said, he introduced me, like, there's a Blink 182 uh, song written about this guy or something. They kind of, That's always been around me my whole life since he wrote it. I was 20. I lived with Tom DeLonge in Pacific Beach. 
and uh, the movie, the show, it was the show, and his Dude Ranch album was being recorded in Rancho Santa Fe. I don't know if I'm allowed to tell them where it was being recorded, but there's like this big mouth studio that I would go to and watch him record. And Taylor Steele was the guy. You know, I mean, at that point, Dude Ranch was not even out yet, and they weren't big time yet. They got MCA, gave them a hundred grand to buy a van and record their album. So they had no money. All the money was going into this album, and they weren't big time yet. So Taylor Steele, I go, I'm, I'm his roommate, and I said, hey, Tom, could you write a song in the next day or so and get it to Taylor recorded so I can put it in my part? And it was such a moment where he was like, this is my opportunity, you know? Like, oh that's where gosh. we were in our careers, where he was like, yes, yes. And I'm eating dinner in our little fucking two-bedroom apartment as he's writing the song. He wrote the song in probably two or three hours, that Mutt song. And it's so funny because he's done tons of art. Like, I've been to about 20 concerts where they bring me up on stage and like, this song's about him. He's... Want to get laid tonight, ladies? And like, they, it's just always like this super funny thing. Uh, K Rock did this interview when I was like 22, when they just blew up, and they're like, Well, this is about our friend that's fucking nuts. Ah, and then they played it. And all my friends in LA are like, Dude, they're just playing mutt. Um, but the whole thing was right when it came out in my surf part, six months later, they're in American Pie. And that's, and he goes, hey, they're using that fucking song in American Pie. And I didn't know what American Pie was. He didn't even know what American Pie was. He's like, this new movie. And it came out, and it's them. And it's the scene of all scenes of the yeah. movie that when we were kids, that was the scene of all scenes. And it's, dar, 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 and he's yeah. running in his underwear and shit. Yeah, he's running across the front yeah. yard trying to pull and dude, his imagine pants. being, oh, I was like 22. I would say I was 22 at that point, 23. And having your best friend that you live with that just made it and your songs on the biggest American pie movie of my generation. And I was just like, this is so surreal. Yeah, it's so it's surreal. Crazy. <laughs> it's nuts. That was one of the coolest things ever for sure. And that, it's cool because not a lot of people know my nicknames mutt. So they had, they didn't understand what the whole meaning was behind it, but the song has nothing to do with me. And that's what he always says in interviews. He, that's why I can't wait to do my podcast with him. It's all, he has two, it's too tight of pants in his seat by or something bicycle seat. He took the seat off his own bike because the way that it felt. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love that you know it. That's exactly what he says. And it's that's actually true. <laughs> but uh the but the lyrics, he's like, everyone's like, is it about him? And it's like he's like, Have you listened to it? Yeah. It's about just an asshole, which is great. That's what makes it even better. It's like take your seat off and it's cause he likes the way it feels. Like, yeah. fuck you. Thanks, wow. Tom. It's epic. And by the way, he's he did Rogan at some point talking about... I just listened to Rogan this morning, The Black Keys on the way up here. Did you oh, see that really? one? That's no, his brand new one came out yesterday. It's so fucking good. That's my favorite band in they're the world, amazing. pretty much. And they're talking about... He, uh, the drummer is talking about meeting Tom DeLong. He comes backstage and he's like, yeah, Tom wanted to meet me and I want to meet him. And he starts going on about these aliens and then fucking Joe... He starts kind of going off on him. Well, you know, he's a little bit out there, and like I don't know. If, but I'm like, dude, the, it's real. Like, is it? I, well, he's. Did you see the thing yesterday? He, the Congress mm. is going into. Oh yeah, yeah. To, to to basically confirm what he's doing is legit. It's a really big milestone for somebody that has been basically thrown under the bus for what was that 16 years? It's been. So do you keep in contact with him? Oh, oh, yeah, all the time. Okay. 2006, I think, is when he quit Blink. It's something like that. Because that's okay. the first year that he saw the video. Yeah, yeah. It's right when he saw the video. He's like, I'm done with Blink. And, but he had all his personal issues and stuff. But think about that. For that long, he kept it to himself. He's building this company and going after these UFOs. And now the Congress is meeting tomorrow, it's today or tomorrow about his company. It's like, what? I know, it's crazy. That's so crazy. Well, the reason I think that people write him off is because his delivery does sound a little loud. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I, 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 I did turn it off, to be honest. <laughs> I love you, Tom, more than peanut butter and jelly. But yeah, when he was talking, it was like chalkboard screens and it didn't come off right. I want to believe in aliens. I and know. like there's, he's he had, Rogan's had other guys on that I'm like, okay, I'm kind of into this and I want right. to find out You should have come on with but, one of those guys maybe. But then with Tom, it's like, he just sounds like it's, it's out there. But yeah, I couldn't agree more. And he's, I love him to death, but it didn't come off like believable. But obviously it is in the sense that he had all the experts come in and go confirm, confirm, confirm. Right. But uh, yeah, what a what an incredible side side project that he was like. Yeah, I'm the biggest punk band in the world right now, but nah, I'm just gonna go check the aliens out. <laughs> like what? That's pretty cool. Um, tell me about 
shaping boards. Oh man, it's my f- it was my favorite thing. So it when did you get going. into it? And- I got into oh, dude. I mean, honestly, uh, the very first Taylor Steele movies. I was fourteen when I started shaping. No underneath the way. pipe house. Underneath the pipe house. You know the Bruce Irons room? Did you ever go to the Volcom house? No. It was all really gnarly. No. That room that Bruce lived underneath was my shaping room that me and Conan Hayes built. And when I was 14, I shaped Chester. I got, Ross had a center spread on one of them. Chester got a rusty on a big barrel. I'd shaped all my friends' boards, but I'd do it. With, back then, we had a planer, but that's it. And then I'd, I used a hand planer for 90% of it because I was so scared of the skill saws. And I would do the rocker, and then I would do the outline, and then I'd use a handsaw the fucking rest of the time. That's We're talking crazy. six hours for one board. And pouring sweat, itchy as hell, one little mask, and the summer's on the North Shore. It was crazy. But then I'm up to 126 or 100, something like that, my amount of boards I've done. And I hate doing them really for people nowadays, but I love doing them for myself because I have a Mick Fanning Kelly, all these boards that I've created a uh, file. So now whenever I want a board, I just put the leaders in, boom, Oceanside cuts it out for me and I finish it in an hour and it's gotcha. perfect. And they're perfect because I know, ex- like when you shape, I, you shape? No. When you shape, you know what you want. Like when you surf, excuse me, when you surf, you know the rails on your favorite board, you're like, God, this is what I want. Well, I was always one that wanted to do my own rails because I knew what I liked. I like a tucked, I like JS rails where it's like soft, but then it's kind of boxy at the bottom, has a really hard edge and a concave. So- I couldn't get that from other people. Al Merrick always nailed it. But now the shaping part about it was always, I've shaped Tom aboard, actually. I've shaped all the kinds of guys. We're going to do so Perry Farrell one. Did you have a logo? Uh, I did. Taylor like, still made it. Like the <laughs> center spread of Ross. Uh-huh. Uh, was there a oh, logo still, on he that? He was right for Blue Hawaii back then. All okay, those guys. Okay. Rusty had a, on Chester's. Okay. But uh, Taylor still made me. Taylor still is a really like hilarious cartoon artist. I don't know if you know that. I didn't know have you ever that. seen Factory Seconds? Yeah. Remember the cover with yeah. all of us yeah, as yeah, cartoons? Yeah, yeah. That's Taylor Steele. No way. He's an f- unbelievable cartoon. I, I wish he would do a children's book. I might have to talk to him about that. Um, but he made, um, it's a little, a little like funny, like Snoopy kind of dog. And I'm like squeezing some block and it's squirting out like this and I'm holding the board and it would go between the stringers. God, I haven't hilarious. seen that logo in so long, but yeah, he made a little mutley. I think it said mutley crew. Or something. That's hilarious. Yeah. I've never so, seen that. Yeah. I should actually, I should post that on Instagram. Yeah. I would love so to bring see in all that. my uh, nostalgia. So you're currently just building boards, one-offs. Oh man, you- I haven't built a board in over a year. I was doing a lot in Bali. So I do, I had a shaping room there and I do it. But here I did Univ surfboards for a long time and I would make like Ben I put stingers and we were doing a bunch of funky stuff. And then Machado just ruined me with this whole like, totally. I'm better than you thing. But you had so. a business. So, so <laughs> who's, who's laminating? Um, always like diamond glassing okay. and all the guys down in San Diego. That's the epicenter for surfboard, whatever, manufacturing. So Got Oceanside it. was the guys that always did my stuff. Did you used to laminate at one point? You know, I've never glassed a surfboard. I can. I know how it works and everything, and I, I good, but I never glassed a surfboard, which kind of, it's kind of weak sauce. If you say you've made surfboards, you should know how to make the whole thing. I do know how to make them, like from start to scratch, but I always like having a four, four ounce with a four ounce deck and make it light as possible, and I know they we could do it way better. Yeah. But no, I'm not a glasser, and that shit's sticky and gross and smelly, and you can have that You need shit. the proper space for it and all that yeah. sort of stuff. and so. setting up your fins is the most critical part. Totally. And it's so so freaking hard to get them perfect with the tape and i don't know um so what's your kind of a couple closing questions what's your current relationship like with surfing um you know my favorite part about surfing nowadays is taking people surfing i i thought about it the other day everyone's like how how many times have you surfed in last year and i was like three times and they're like where and i i go well i took Kurt Hammett surfing on a longboard in Waikiki. I took, and it's always like a, not only just famous people, but just friends that have never done it. And then I'm always laughing because I'm, I'm not surfing and I'll surf to show off. That sounds corny, but I'm honest. Uh, and if I'm with someone that's famous or someone that I look up to or someone that I really, really just have a good relationship, friend, friendship with, I like to go out, get an air or a snap and kind of show off and then sh- take them surfing because I promise you, like just like golf nowadays, I like t- showing people how to golf more than do it. Really, I, it's I'm like I have this teacher thing. Like Ross Williams being a coach yeah. was one of the funniest things ever because he was really not that competitive. Ross was never right. really, and he wasn't even that good in contest. He was one of the best surfers to ever live, but he never really was that good of a competitor. 
So for him to be a coach, laugh, it's, I think even Dorian's like, and then we first started doing it, like, Ross is a coach? And he became so good at it. And it's because I think when you get to our age, and he's even like three or four years older than me, you have all this knowledge and you can go keep doing it for yourself, but it's so much more rewarding to see someone else use that knowledge. And now I realize that's why I get so off on what teaching someone that just learned how to swing and go, no, 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 let's, you know, think of it this way, think of it this way. And then watching him do it, I'm like, yes. And then it, it excites me. And surfing, same thing, man. Like when I go surfing by myself, I'm like, what am I do? Another error? Like, what am I do? A big roundhouse and like, woo. Like it's more or less uh, appealing to me to see somebody get up, and then all of a sudden make their first turn. I'm like, exactly, keep the knee in. Like, oh, back sick, keep your chin up. Don't look down, fucking, you know? So I, I'm I, the most, I'm the least competitive guy of our crew, and I'm starting to want to be a coach. It seems weird, right? See, it is weird. So I, um, I'm i surprised to hear you say all of this. <laughs> it's funny, and I, I'm even surprised. I've surfed less and less the older I get because I have adult obligations in life, you know? Yeah. But all the while, I'm missing surfing, and lying to myself saying that I'm going to go tomorrow and all that kind of stuff. And I haven't accepted what it, I feel like you're saying you've accepted, yeah. which is just not surfing anymore. Right. I, in my head, I'm still going to surf more next week than I surfed this week. Right. No, I, it's that honesty of excuses for everything, man. I have ex but, that, that day of me wanting to do stand up and I had 20 excuses. Okay. 20. I have those for surfing. So you too. still do want to surf? Oh, I and I still do every once in a while. My girlfriend's been getting me in the water randomly. The last two surfs I've had is because she's like, please, let's surf. I'm like, all right. Yeah. But the thing is, is like in anything in life that's challenging, you're always, the older you get, the more you make excuses. So, Well, the easiest excuse is when you've surfed good waves for a long time, yeah. most of your life, yeah. it's hard to go surf around here. Yeah, that's you know? a very good point. And so I find myself lacking motivation just because the waves suck. Yeah. But I also find myself enjoying... The process, uh, right? Yeah, that's yeah. it. You know, Dude, like it's early, session. the water's cold, that feels good. I want to paddle, that exercise feels good. I'm not going to do an air. Don't care about that anymore. If I could just get a wave or two, go down the line. It's like the first day of the drive through I told you I didn't surf for years before that session. Mm -hmm. And I'm the one that knew what we needed. And I'm like, I know it's flat. I know it's, and it, <laughs> we pull up to Dane right then. And he goes, I walk up to him. I'm like, hey, so where do we go out? And he goes, you guys are going out? <laughs> he, he said it. And it was still one of my favorites. We didn't film it. But he goes, hey, you guys are going to go out? And I was like, yeah, we have to every day. And I was the guy, if you watch the drive through saying, hey, the tide's going to push you guys. There's going to be a perfect little left right here. We're going to have the best little session. It looks like shit right now, but we'll make the most of it. And that's how I've been in my life, but I'm not like that anymore. But I knew that that's what we needed. Yeah. And eventually it got this big Parker ripping and that whole thing came together. And it was like, usually I, if it was a normal day, I would have looked at it and went like, well, obviously we're not serving. Like, right. I'm right. like, Dane, I'm like, well, there's course lights on ice. Like exactly. what are we doing here? So but you got, got that was crew. one of my favorite parts about the drive. That's through. hilarious. It was like having my step, step brothers. I was right. like, I'd look at him and be like, yeah, Exactly. And then like that, and then we'd have in and out Burger, and he's like, again? I'm like, again. <laughs> it was fucked up. We had in and out three days in a row. Dane was like, is this really how you guys eat every time? I'm like, no, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, probably. Um, whose boards are you riding? When you I've been surf? with Al Merrick forever. So you're still riding Merrick? Well, I still get them. Every, like, they gave me their last board, because, you know, there's like 3,000 behind stock or whatever. You know, like, I'm sure these guys Inventory. are. Inventory. Yeah, Inventory. Yeah, yeah. They, they found one board. They're like, I promise you. And it was luckily, because I'm so big. It was 38 liters or something. They're like, we have 138. I'm like, perfect. And it was a brown tail, and it saved me for the, like the only board that flew <laughs> flow to me. But um, since then, I've been getting, you know, I get boards from, I was going to get an album board because I rode at the US Open. And now it's like, I want to ride thickest, fattest boards and just have fun. And I've been doing like Dark Arts has been giving me boards. Uh, Chewy Reina at Firewire has been giving me boards. Well, now there's just, you know, there's so many boards to choose from. So yeah. it's a different world. Everything's different. And, yeah. You know, like the fact that I have to be narcissistic in uh, being uh, a person now with my own Instagram and be like, look at, look at this. And, you know, you like, can, you can avoid it. Dude, Sonny Garcia's and the people that I grew up idolizing, if they had to do their own social media, it would have been a middle finger. Like Todd Chester, if he had to do Instagram, it would be his balls 
on Monday. Tuesday would be the shaft and then the head. And then like Friday would be the, him taking a dump. It would have been like. But when you go to the grid page, it all comes together <laughs> exactly. into one picture. You swipe, you're all bump, bump. That is his dick. Um, but yeah, <laughs> well, I just think our generation, you have to be a little you, bit. You do yourself. and you don't. You can do it your own way. Like John John doesn't. He posts once every two months. You know what I mean? <laughs> John, like it's him sailing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> With money flying exactly. out the back like this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I love John. John is, he's old school when it comes to uh, how he portrays himself. Like, he's so humble that if you don't like John John, you actually have to look in the mirror and go, who the fuck am I? Totally. Like, yeah, he's on. Un, he's undeniable. That's why I love him. But then there's the guys that are like Gabriel that are a little bit more in your face and a little bit more glammy and stuff, but undeniable as well. Like well, he is. He's, he's undeniable. And he has man. eight times the Instagram followers because of it. Oh, really? Because he's yeah, because he face. is outgoing. But with John, that stuff. John's like, I don't need eight million. <laughs> one will do. One yeah, million will yeah, do. Totally. You know what I mean? And like that one million are all like surf hardcore surf yeah. fans you know the people that don't follow too many people um final question for you is are you a believer in crystals now oh dude i'm telling you right are now you, if, I mean, if i start making money like she said there's this yellow green one that kind of i picked out she's like oh and she goes are you really into money and i'm like are you kidding me i i don't even know if i have any and she's like this one right here is telling me something good about your future adventures or never or whatever and i was just like don't jinx it. <laughs> so I Don't I, jinx it with these crystals. Well, you did a good job of s explaining how much you respected her and believed that she believed what she believed. Uh -huh. But did you walk away from that conversation wanting to go buy crystals? Well, and she's put them making me a necklace with the stone that's that represents me and all this other stuff. So I will keep you informed. Okay. okay. But I'll tell you right now, I tried New Balance. Remember the, what was uh, no, it, it wasn't New Balance. What was those things called? I was sponsored. Power, by. Power Balance. Power Balance, right? And I I could swear I made more errors when I wore those things. Are you kidding? <laughs> no, uh, but I did kind of, right? I well, mean, I what I didn't understand, what I did not understand about that is, okay, it's Power Balance. You put it on a wrist. I'm like, just one wrist? I know, if it's I thought, balanced, shouldn't I, you have it on both we wrists? We should have had them as chokers. So we look Somewhere cool in the too. middle, at least. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like, how is that belts. balancing you by putting it on no, one that, And they were at, every, we had parties in Hollywood with, like, Paris Hilton. I was like, power balance, baby. And then they're like, it doesn't work. I'm like, oops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. no, I, I do believe um, in a lot of different energies and stuff. I mean, that, there's been times, I know this sounds crazy. Well, it doesn't even matter if it sounds crazy because it's honest. I was in uh, Java at R Rizal's Pachitan home, and there's a crystal mountain that I found out later. And when I, and this happened, <laughs> there's no way around it. I smoke a lot of weed. This really happened. I was in a dark room sleeping, and I had to go pee. So I tried to get up, and I couldn't get up. And I was awake. I mean, th this is so scary. I couldn't get out of my bed. Everything in my body was telling me, let's go pee. And I couldn't. And then I started panicking. And all I could move was my chin. I was like, and I, my body wouldn't get up. And I was fucking losing it. And it happened for like five minutes. And I was like, I finally just kind of sat there and let it go. And I was like, oh. And then all of a sudden I got up. And I was like, what? And something held me down. And then later, Rizal goes, oh. He's like, the, he goes, that's totally normal. And I go, no, it isn't. What are you talking about? He goes, this mountain right here is full of crystals. And he goes, there's this thing that around this mountain and all this stuff. And I was like, all right, all right. I'm not talk about that anymore. So I tried to get that out of my life, but that really happened. And I talked to a bunch of other people in Indonesia and they're like, oh, it's that's happened to me too. Or I can't get out of bed. And I'm like, what? what? So either I'm lazy, I was sleeping, I was too stoned. I don't know. But there is something more to the crystals and the energy of this earth. I mean, we are just one piece of this earth. We're just a little particle that's like this table, right? This table's cooler than me. That's for sure. I, uh, I'm going to go and listen to that episode. <laughs> I, I also just interviewed, I just published it yes, yesterday or today, an, an interview with Drew Brophy, the, the guy from artist, Bro oh, no, the artist who did all those lost surfboards in the 90s. Okay. Like Chris yeah. Ward's boards. Like, like uh, Glom, John Glom, like similar, like yeah. the one they paint with the pins. Exactly, posh like pins. That. Yeah. Anyways, he got- Is he from here? He's San Clemente guy, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he got COVID and literally almost died, like- was in a coma for 30 days, what? push, like got, had a near death experience while he was in co in a coma where, yeah, where he like saw the light, you oh. know, and had to come back from it. So anyways, he's in recovery now getting back all his motor functions and stuff, but talking to him about going through an experience like that, he's like all the prayers that people were sending was energy that I could 
feed off of. And like it, there's something else out there. He's like, I saw the light. There's nothing to be afraid of. Everything that I was feared before, I no longer fear. Love matters. Just be kind to one another. Don't be afraid of any. It was freaking. Did you meet him before all that happened? Did you see a different? Wow. It was it was wild though, and so hearing stuff like that of people who have been through things, yeah. I do. I am completely open yeah, to the crystal conversation. Why, why or not? Right? What's the worst thing that can happen by being open to things? Yeah, that obviously have affected many million. I mean, think about what other cultures use crystals as real stuff. Yeah, and then you're like, well, they're not doing it just to be hipsters. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. this isn't the girl with the Bohemian room in Encinitas that's trying to like bring in all these. You know, good vibes. Good vibes. It's more or less seeing what it's done for other cultures and stuff, and then seeing how much work goes into one of the stones, like Amberis, or I, I probably said that wrong, but like Jade, and and then he tell you what Jade means. Why would they go through all that if it was just this pink stone? You right. know, it's like it actually has a description that goes on for like two or three different um, novels. So yeah. there is something to it, and it's exciting to actually let your ego go. That for me, I've been a, I have to be right guy my mm-hmm. whole life. I've always had to be right. Shane Dorian would always say, oh, you always have to be right. Because I would be like, if my idea was wrong, I'd fight to the end till they agreed with my idea. When it was really, I should have just been like, yeah, you're probably right. Right. And now and that I'm older, I'm it. always yeah. wrong. I Whenever I can be wrong, I say, I'm wrong. I'm stupid. I'm an idiot. I'm wrong. Because it's so powerful. Whenever you want to be right, it's so weak sauce. It's yeah. like, why do you want to be right so bad? Like, yeah. what's the point? Are you going to win something? Is there a prize? Who knows? No, Ego. it's like, always be open. Always always be okay with being the person that's sitting there listening. It's such a more powerful position. Yeah. Well, Benji. Dude, uh, I love we, it. We yeah. covered a lot in 90 minutes. I feel nice. like you've spoken more than uh, most people do in two hours. Yeah, so nice. well done. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of coffee. And uh, looking forward to Let's Party. Let's Potty. I like Let's Party. Let's Potty. <laughs> And also looking forward to stand up too. So, oh, yeah, you if you have time, twenty seventh, twenty eighth in uh, Belly Up, Solana Beach. Perfect. If anyone has any urge to come watch that thing, watch me. It, the best part is, is I'm probably going to eat a bunch of dicks and eat a lot of crap, and everyone around me is going to be pointing and laughing, and hopefully in a good way. And if if people can't get there, they'll see it on the internet. I'm sure. True. Yeah. Somebody will film it and put it on YouTube to yeah. make fun. Well, Taylor Steele and Greg Brownie are going to be there. If Perfect. they don't film it, they're fired. Perfect. All right, Benji. Thank you. Right on. <laughs>